Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert, and today I get to talk with Ron Newcomb. Now, he's a filmmaker and a storyteller at heart, and so it will be no surprise to you that I pick his brain on how to get these projects off the ground, whether it's films, as he's done, or comic books, as he's done, or any other type of project that you monster makers out there have in mind for those of you in interested in creating fantasy story worlds or science fiction story worlds. Because Ron has a lot of experience, let me run down real quick his bio. He's a director, writer, actor, producer, and he's created The Forge Studios at any... I'm going to drop the links into the description on this episode, by the way, so you can catch up with him and look into all the projects he's been doing. Um, He's written and directed award-winning short and feature-length independent films. Uh, He founded FCF, a network of over 1,800 faith-based filmmakers and film enthusiasts. I pick his brain about that in a little bit. Um, He's got, let's see, he's one of the founders of the Fantasy Network. It's a streaming fantasy platform. We're going to talk about that. You've got to check that out. Um, He's developed a feature film, The Fellow's Hip, The Fellowship, not The Fellowship, The Fellow's Hip, Rise of the Gamers. Um, And that's been um, all, well, it's been translated and pushed all over the world. Um, Also, he's been into documentaries, Made in the USA, a 30-day journey about the brand Made in the USA and what that means these days. Um, He's been developing his own intellectual property with the Rangers. Um, He's all over the place and he's uh, essentially an indie filmmaker and indie project renaissance man. And that's not even to mention his four different comic books he's got going. And so, uh, as I, as I share in a minute, uh, I get a lot of questions from a lot of you about how in the world do I get my indie project going in this day and age when, when New York and LA seem to be shut off to so many of us trying to create stories of our own. Well, Ron's the guy to ask about that. So here we go. It's, it's really a pleasure to talk with you, man. And uh, you are a, a renaissance man in the world of, of across media platforms. Um, and at this point, I will have already told listeners a whole lot, uh, named a whole lot of the projects that you're into. But in short, director, writer, actor, producer of all sorts of stuff. And yeah. um and uh, our our friend in common, a, a fantastic a director and visionary in his own right, Eric Yeager, kind of connected us. But I also kind of knew you through, I guess the connection was through Legendarium Media, uh, who, yeah. who's great and who I follow. So what's your connection with Legendarium? Yeah, no, it's funny. It's a good little pass there. So with Legendarium, originally it was a group of um, uh, fans and gamers with the love of things that are fantasy predominantly and, and sci-fi as well. They're kind of the same coin, just different sides. Um, they formed a group that they called the Middle Earth Network. And so back then they were looking at considering how to do story and bring story into the fold of the community that they had built. And so I was brought on to that core team to try to help with that and to try to stand up some video elements. And then Eric actually replaced me in that group right at the transition. It went from a name change from Middle Earth Network to, over to Legendarium, which it is now. So I'm still affiliated um, with uh, Legendarium specifically. And then through the Fantasy Network, which is another streaming platform for fantasy and sci-fi content, um, we partnered up with Legendarium, uh, and so Legendarium is looking to me like the news outlet arm, and then the Fantasy Network is kind of the the vig- video and streaming 
uh, platform. Yeah, very cool. Let, yeah, let's just jump to the Fantasy Network for for a minute because that's sure. that's a fantastic pro- project, and it's one that um, I don't I don't know how many people uh, quite know about it yet or know about this kind of thing, but I really I'm really seeing the the media of the future kind of going this direction this kind of subscribing to the particular things that you want as your media and so so tell us a little bit about the idea of the fantasy network and how that works and yeah no happy to this this is my passion this is where it's at um you talked about you know kind of jokingly that the renaissance man but i would say the the thread that kind of runs it through is that i'm a storyteller and so through the fantasy network this really started as a pain point as an independent fantasy content creator filmmaker creating content and then trying to get it out there to the masses and all those challenges that that comes together and so we put together a think tank. I'm from the DC area and that's one of the things we do well. And so we partnered up with around 15 other filmmakers that were at a level. So they were not necessarily new filmmakers. They were all over the world. So we had people in the UK and people up in Canada and, you know, people here obviously in the States. And it was fantastic. It was 15 of us. And we would just get together like once a quarter with no real agenda other than just trying to help each other create win-wins and try to advance um, all the good for fantasy independent content because we loved fantasy. We're fans first, and so we wanted to see more of it, and the studios are taking less risk coming up with less originality and it's understandable why you know they they lose and it's a major loss and so that's where indies can come in and fulfill that gap well through that coalition two years later we came together a few of us and officially formed the fantasy network and so if you go to the fantasy dot network this is a a network of fantasy and sci-fi content that is streamed we have a lot of apps so you can find us on Roku and Apple and Android, uh, be it on your TV or your phone. Um, you can certainly go on the internet and watch us. 80% of our content is free. It's just to get it out there to people. Um, we do have a paid platform, but we have an awesome strategy of what we're getting ready to kind of unfold to bring it out to even garner more content and to to get more people involved. Because our differentiating factor is we believe everybody has a story to tell. Everyone's an artist. Um, and they just need an opportunity. And so this is an opportunity to co-create with us and then potentially get your content up on the platform. So we actually have op- opened up and offered some of the worlds that we created as open IP to create with us freely. So I created a fantasy called the Rangers and we have this epic fantasy world called Adrasil and there's a lot of mythos and history with it. And you can, I invite you actually freely that you can create in that world. So you can, you know, write, draw, paint. You don't need to worry about copyright. I'm giving the copyright to uh, people to allow them to create with us. And if you are a filmmaker like us, you can film in the world and submit it to us to be considered to be put on the network. If it's not, then it's awesome. It's great. We'll like it on YouTube, throw it up on our social media for you. But if it's good enough and reaches a certain quality, then you actually get put onto the network and you get to partake in the financial rewards um, through what the fantasy network takes in. So it really is kind of a unique element. It isn't just a passive, hey, I want to watch some fantasy. And this is a way that we, the in, the enthusiasts, the filmmakers, the fans, can be empowered to allow more fantasy content and sci-fi content to be created. Yeah, that's that's so cool. And this kind of thing would not have been possible in any way that I can conceive of 15 years ago, hell, even 10 years ago. Like your only option as a filmmaker would be put all that money into a bus ticket to L.A. <laughs> like right. do your best. There man. you go. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's also cool that, you know, I mean, YouTube changed, it changed everything really fast, but it's kind of like this 
wide open playground. And yeah. the, so like a playground with a bunch of basketball courts. And then there's the NBA of Hollywood and there's no real in between for somebody who's like good enough to make it on a team. <laughs> right. But, yeah, but right. won't get let in by the pros. And this sounds like the perfect kind of, the the perfect i don't know if it's an in between it's more like a different path altogether yeah it really is empowering um the fans to be able to become creators themselves where there's yeah there are a lot of opportunities out there for content placement but those decisions are are being made in LA you know and and it's hard for people particularly independent filmmakers to get their stuff up on Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, which is the three primary we all like to talk about most because they've been the biggest disruptors. But yeah. the disruptors in distribution, not how they're creating content. They're very traditional in how they're creating. So they're partnering up with people that are going to be able to mitigate their risk. Well, this is, again, where we can step up. We can risk boldly to create cool and new epic content. If you want original fantasy and sci-fi, then, you know, we can all do this together. We can't do this alone. It's going to fail hundred percent. But if we, the collective, we can come together, there's nothing we can't stop us. Yeah. And so that's, that kind of leads me to the next question that I know a lot of listeners are, are wondering, cause I've got, I've got a lot of listeners who are college students, um, who have ideas for projects, but no resources, no experience, no real idea how to make those projects come alive. Uh, a lot of people who are maybe are not associated with college at all, but are writers. They have creative people. They have really cool ideas. And, and when they come to me, like, oh, I've got this book idea, I can help them. I'm a writer <laughs> or like even yeah. with podcasting, it costs me, I think, zero dollars, not counting equipment to have this podcast so far. <laughs> and so right. and uh, but but your projects, man, your, your filmmaking, your comic stuff. I mean, that takes that takes crazy amounts of coordination <laughs> and serious yeah. resources. And so when those writers or their students are like, hey, man, I got a film idea. I got a comic book idea. What should I do? I'm kind of like. I have no freaking idea <laughs> what you do is, <laughs> especially this day and age, but you do, you've got a ton of projects. So, so any advice for them? Like if they've got an idea for a film, they've got a screenplay they want to get made or comic book idea of video game idea. What in the world? How do you get that going? Yeah, no, it is kind of the big hairy question out there to, to figure out. And what I will say is, that although I think I can give some guidelines for people to be able to shoot after, what I have found is that most people that I have talked to, each story is unique. And so embracing the fact that it's probably going to be a unique path, but certainly there it, there are some guidelines that you can do. And I would be certainly remiss, most of us, and what we've done on the Fantasy Network has been crowdfunding, and that's definitely through the crowd. But what I will say is crowdfunding has just become really, really hard. Unless it's a physical product, crowdfunding has become difficult, uh, particularly for filmmakers, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But board games are crushing it right now on, on crowdfunding, but films, man, it is hard just to reach um, – you know, a few thousand dollars, much less trying to raise, you know, $50,000 for a, a short film or something. Huh. Do you think and, it's, and, do you think it's the fans just like hoping you'll figure it out and, and the disconnection to a physical artifact from it or I, what in the world? I, yeah, no, I think that it's just, we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot. I think that there's been some filmmakers that have yet to complete their what they committed to do when oh, they okay. had a successful campaign and so people have gotten kind of burned on man i never received that reward or i never did this and and i'll admit i have a campaign right now that i'm still i was hoping to be wrapped up and i'm still working towards and it's one of my films that i'm still driving towards so i can com, can appreciate from the filmmaker's lens that hurdle but i do believe that it's a hurdle from a fan point of view is that people they feel like man i've given before and i'm not seeing either the quality or the product or i'm not even receiving something i've seen a few films that have wiped out and didn't get made altogether and that hurts the collective yeah. and that's why i appreciate the again the crew that we pulled together for the fantasy network um 
traditionally has not been like that. Uh, we have one partner, Airstorm Entertainment, that have been doing some really cool fantasy. They have a TV show, The Outpost, that's on the CW that people should check out. Um, and their Mythica series, they did, I believe it's five, a five part film series, um, uh, five films and which you can find on the fantasy network as well. But they've been able to kind of use crowdfunding as almost they put the front cost in and then are using it for like post production almost to, to get, um, further post production in. And you can also, it's kind of interesting as a filmmaker and kind of can gauge the, how well your story or film project may or may not do based upon what the fans um, are going to generate behind. But kind of going back and anchoring it to if I'm a college person, how do I get my stuff made? Crowdfunding is an option. It's just understanding how big of a lift it is as well as um, setting your expectation. I had, I had a guy one time that was trying to raise like, you know, a million dollar <laughs> somehow, right? I mean, it's it's – it's, I try to, in my best way, I tried to encourage them to be like, look, man, that you're never going to get that, you know, on, uh, on crowdfunding. He had no name attached. So, um, you know, to set clear expectations, you know, and I also think that you can do a lot with a little these days. There, look, money is not a problem. It's the problem. But right now that cannot be a hurdle that you allow to sideline you because year after year will go by and you will do nothing. Now, the Fantasy Network specifically, we have strong visions and plans that if you do a, a short fantasy or sci-fi project, for instance, you can submit it for distribution on the network. And if we pick it up, you become a Fantasy Network producing partner, which then qualifies you to obtain uh, – to be able to apply for some financial production funds within the network. And so if you, you know, once you get a project onto the network, you can get some production money from the network, which I think is, again, kind of unique in that effort. And we're yeah. always looking to try to help out uh, and get the word out about uh, filmmakers. But I think that you cannot allow the barrier of entry to, to, to stop you. You've got to do something. Um, I've also just unfortunately have found it to be true that – you're, I've rarely seen it where you can come in with like no money. You know, you're going to have to come up with some way to come up with a little bit of capital, uh, to be able to start to get the momentum going. You had mentioned that I'm actually currently doing four comic books. I took four of my screenplays, my film ideas and turned them into comic books. Well, partly. And I'm going to be doing a crowdfunding around that. And by partly, I mean that I paid for the cover art and two pages of the comic, as well as some sketches of characters from four specific artists. And I had them done professionally so that I can then do the crowdfunding campaign. So it wasn't like I didn't spend any money. Um, you know, I spent several thousand dollars just to get that done. And so, you know, I work a nine to five job. I have a family with four little girls and another one on the way. I totally get the, uh, if you're not a college student that you're, you know, there's still some financial obligation and considerations, but there's ways to get it made. There's ways to squirrel it away and you're not an island. I see so many filmmakers out there trying to do this on their own and I don't know where people got that from. Filmmaking is in itself naturally a artistic collaboration. It's bringing people together. There are people out there that want to help you. Now, granted, you have to find the right partner, right? I have some nightmares of, you know, the wrong partners, but you have to find the right partner, but there are partners out there that are willing to help you. So that's, that's another thing. So the first is consider crowdfunding. The second is assume you're going to have to come up with something, be it a little bit of cash, some concept element to get it going. And third, find the right partner. 
That's a that's fantastic advice, and not only that, but a pathway. If like if somebody listening to this has, man, I got a I've got a short, or could put together enough for a short film to submit to Fantasy Network. Uh, yep. So they would. So I'll I'll provide the link in the description of this episode. But for now, it's the Fantasy dot Network, and then that's where they can find all that information about about not only not only watching it and checking out what's there, but uh, submitting their own work. Absolutely. And you can also email me directly, ron at the fantasy dot network. Um, you can shoot me an email and I will jump right on it. We are definitely look actively looking for content. I'm kind of the, the chief content officer, if you will. Um, none of us really carry titles because we're all filmmakers at heart, <laughs> but I've been very actively trying to go out and pursue, um, the original content from out there. And it doesn't need to be exclusive with us either. So that means let's say you have something from the past that's been on YouTube or you have some other piece of content that's been elsewhere. We're trying to be a one-stop shop aggregator for content. So someone might come on and say, oh, wow, I've never seen that before, you know, because they didn't come across it on YouTube. And they can go to all things for fantasy and sci-fi. That's where they go to the fantasy network. Man, that's huge. That's awesome. And you've, and, uh, and you brought up the comic book thing. So I want to get to that because I got a, I got a chance to take a look at a couple of pages of Outlawed Faith, this kind of like futuristic Western, uh, I almost said space cowboy, but it's not space cowboy really. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. No, it, it's, but, it's, it's kind of that. It's definitely trying to go after, you know, we all love Firefly and we all wish it would come yeah. back. But Josh Whedon has made it clear it's not coming back. <laughs> and it's not like that's what I intended to to kind of go after. Um, I created an original story, but it it definitely is is feeding that within me and I I've seen that resonate with others. I kind of did a a steampunk diesel punk mashup and it's kind of hell on wheels. Um you know, if, if you're familiar with that show meets yeah. Firefly, that's the way I describe it. Yeah. And I, and you know, when I, when I found out that you had some indie comic projects, I'm like, I want to take a look at it, but I have, uh, I, I have, I don't know, tempered expectations about the art when I see somebody's sure. <laughs> indie comic book project. Cause you know, a lot of times you end up going, well, you know, you drew this yourself or your, or your friend did and, and you guys, you, you really tried. <laughs> but, right. you know, if I'm right. like, if I'm hooked on Mike Mignola, then it's going to take a whole lot to get me interested in anybody else's art. And I take a look at this thing and it is like full on top level, beautiful professional stuff. And I'm thinking, how in the world did he do this? There's no way he could be this good of an artist too. This would take a <laughs> lifetime of dedication. But you're saying that's one that you, you went ahead and, and decided to invest money in that and making it, and making it look like the vision you had in mind. So you hired a, a, a pro artist. Is that right? That's it. And, and I would even say what I did was, I knew I was going to, have to spend some money. I couldn't afford like the Marvel and DC um, artist, right? But I wanted that level because I think you're right. On one hand, as an indie artist, I want to be compared to people at my level. You know, that's my yeah. internal heart. And when I go and see an indie film, I kind of grade on that curve. But the truth is the most the rest of the world does not do that. <laughs> yeah. To your point, you know, you're, you're used to some other artist. You're going to, that's what you're going to compare it to. And that's what we're up against. That's what we're competing against. Marvel, DC, you know, image comics. Those are, that's the expectation. That's what the industry is yielding. And so I thought, man, I've got to hit that level. I feel like I'm hitting it with the story. Not only is, am I one of the writers, but I have a great writing team as well for these four comics. Each of them, their own voice, each of them very unique. But again, you saw Outlawed Faith, the steampunk Western sci-fi. And what I did was I reached out to um, uh, some guys that they're not at the DC Marvel level in their profession yet. But man, they are skyrocketing up there. And so I jumped in at that level. So they wouldn't cost me the Marvel rates. But so they were very reasonable, but it wasn't free either. To your yeah. point, it wasn't like, you know, my cousin doing the artwork. Um, and you know, there's some, well, you know, you kind of have to, there's some sympathy expectation there, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you don't want that. You want it looking strong. And I, 
Uh, I think you're right. Out of all the comics that I have right now, the Outlawed Faith, I mean, he just crushed it. He nailed it. It's exactly what I had in my head. It looks awesome. Yeah, and that, and that makes such a smooth transition. You said you had these screenplays first, and then you went to the comic because not only is the comic book kind of the, you know, the, the artifact in and of itself that's fun to really cool to look through and read and everything, but it already gives you a storyboard for your film. I'm, I was guessing at right. least that that's one reason why so many comic books kind of transition to films, uh, is because you've already got professional storyboards laid out for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it is a film is a visual medium. And so therefore comics is too, right? Um, the films are just moving. And so exactly, you can see that and you really can see in your mind's eye. You don't even need to, there's not a big leap. Um, you can see the movement and the way the artistry and some of it happens right now. Um, if you are a, a person that has a screenplay and no representation, the likelihood of your script original script not based on ip being made is you're better off playing the lottery i I wish i could say that wasn't true (laughs) yeah i I wish that wasn't true but it is true and if we know that going into it then your first stop should be to try to get an agent that's what that's what you should be working on as a screenwriter um the second thing is you should be getting you know doing the festival run to try to get pedigree around that particular script so that you can get an agent. <laughs> yeah. The agent is the thing you need and you should have more than just one script. You should try to have at least two. The third option is is to develop IP. So IP is intellectual property and what that does for the studios and the streamers it allows them to see what the audience will yield from it and it allows them to mitigate risk. So that's why they're having a hard time creating original content is because when they risk like that and it wipes out, it's, it can be a big wipeout. Yeah. But if they based it upon something, another IP that's done really well, a la Walking Dead, then they can kind of assume there's at least going to be some audience there. And, you know, it's kind of like what I was referring to with crowdfunding is that by you creating a a comic, for instance, this is really going to show me whether or not I have an audience for Outlawed Faith or I don't. And I'll be able to take that if my crowdfunding does well. Imagine that if I'm able to raise, you know, $50,000 and I get a thousand fans. And then I go to a agent or a studio and try to get the screenplay. It's a different conversation than I know you never heard of me and I know you never heard of my idea, (laughs) but you know, will you make my movie? And the answer is likely going to be no. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's, and it's more and more like that now, I think, because the, you know, the, the costs are getting so much for, you know, the, uh, for those on the other side of the gatekeepers, whether it's for books in, in New York City or films in LA. And so they're kind of watching, they're watching these, these, uh, kind of indie projects to see, can you make it on you? Can you get fans on your own? Can you make it on your own first before right. we then snatch you up? Yeah. There you go. So, yep. and if you don't, if we've been talking about like the, the boots on the ground level kind of production and ideas and how you get these, get these things going if if you don't mind to zoom out a little bit just talking in general about about the world of storytelling and fantasy and the world of storytelling and science fiction i don't think i don't think anything any other particular genre has that kind of passionate mass appeal that fan if you're gonna like you said two sides of the same coin we can put fantasy and sf together uh quite easily so if we do man i don't think anything has that kind of appeal in fact uh i think it was tom shippy once quoting a uh a uh a, a top level um book publisher saying uh that there's that the only the only mainstream genre is fantasy. Everything else is niche genre <laughs> genres. <laughs> I like uh, and, uh, and there's some truth to that. So, so what's your take since you're deep into the fantasy and SF yeah. world? Like what's your take on that appeal? Why does it, why does it appeal yeah. so passionately to so many? 
Yeah, well, first let me tell you that I am a person that loved Lord of the Rings so much that way before the the tours came, a bunch of my buddies hopped on a plane and went to New Zealand. <laughs> and um, that's serious, I, man. I said, I yeah, that is serious, right? I I said I would never get a tattoo unless it you know actually meant something. And if you know anything about the Lord of the Rings, the actors they all got a number nine in Elvish nine <laughs> and three of my best friends, uh, three of us were, were part of the crew that went to New Zealand. We all have an Elvish letter number three on us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how serious I am. That's about funny. Right yeah. Now. I taught, I'm an Uber fan. <laughs> I um, taught a, I taught a, uh, a talking liter, a talking literature class in college this, uh, recent semester. And not only did some of my students already come in with Tolkien tattoos, but at least one of them got a tattoo during the semester. <laughs> and so, and, right. and I always offer to my students, if you get any class notes tattooed on your arm or face, I give you one bonus point. <laughs> and, <laughs> expecting never any of them to ever actually follow through on that kind of snarky offer and yet in the Tolkien class they they actually did <laughs> they actually might yeah right no too funny no i mean we are passionate about it and it's because something resonates with us a lot of people know about joseph campbell's you know the hero's journey and and yeah. it, you know goes all the way back to the poetics and and um to antiquity yeah. And and so it's it's really written the story the hero's journey is written on our heart and, and and in our souls it's it's written on our DNA I'm a person of faith and 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 I believe in that and it's written there for a reason and so with all the political climate that we find ourselves in and yet as the world comes together it it always it, it recently has never felt more divisive as well and so it's hard to be so no so on the nose with things that can be divisive whereas fantasy and sci-fi we're able to both sides are kind of able to claim it we're able to go in and talk about certain topics and issues without offending the other and it actually draws people together um i believe I can't recall who said it Tolkien or C.S. Lewis but it just allows the palate to be more able to to consume a theme or a message in the fantasy or sci-fi trappings yeah. and you know I and, and I don't think it's like undertone I think it's just a way we're able to consume it and we all are the hero in our own journey in our own destiny and we all love to see stories of hope and redemption. And those are generally the strong themes that a lot of fantasy and sci-fi take on. And so I, I believe that's why it resonates with us so much is that we long for better days. And there's some of us that long for the, the future of what, uh, you know, the science fiction can do for us. Um, and, and others that long for the days of long since past that long to have a sword in their hand, uh, which is kind of what I lean towards, you know, the, where honor meant something and, and these morals were high and we treated people at a different level than we, we do now. And so I think that that woos people to those specific genres. And what I found is we think we're so unique and there's only a few of us. And really, as we know through the Comic Con's <laughs> attendance, is that there's an army, right? There's an army of us. And again, getting it back to the fantasy network, if we just come together, there's nothing we can't do. There's we don't have to be dependent upon, let's say, the studios to get stuff made or to make stuff. Yeah, and you're not kidding about desiring a sword in your hand. You even have one in your profile picture, I believe. Yes, I do. You with the sword. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and you and you brought up and you brought up your uh, your faith and um, that's something that I I admired you know for years and years watching Eric Yeager kind of put together his projects as I'm thinking man the 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 number of filmmakers who are open about their Christian faith can't be that many with some notable exceptions it L A doesn't seem like a very kind of Christian world and. Um, uh, despite the name, uh, you know, Los Angeles, but, um, yeah. and then, and, but, you know, he's interested in fantasy too. You are too. And this is obviously a, an established tradition, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, for instance, of, of this link between like fantasy world storytelling and Christian faith. 
what what is that link do you think I, I think it is the the Christ story written on uh, you know again on our on our souls and our DNA. It, it's what longs us. It's what woos us. And uh, as we, we Christians know what that is, um, but we all have it within us. And so that's why everybody's kind of pulled to it. You know, there's a a great organization that if people are interested in filmmaking and screenwriting, they should know about. That's called Act One, and it's in based out of LA and they are making an impact kind of from the inside out by training up people professionally in writing and in producing. And they've also been able to kind of make that connection of faith and story together in a very strong and impactful way that um, is yielding results now. I mean, we, we look at at shows where we find ourselves in an interesting time where families, I mentioned I have four little girls and there's not a lot for us to watch on TV, but then um, suddenly, you know, Hallmark comes out with uh, a TV show. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, written by a gentleman named Brian Bird. Uh, it has the name hope in it. Um, anyways, it's a, you know, set in kind of the, the 1800s and it, it's very, family friendly and there's overt faith in it. And it's like, I don't know if it's the number one show out there right now, but it is, it's high, high marks. And there was no expectation that they were going to be on for as long as they are, but they're going into their seventh season now. And I think that has to, that is very much showcasing what people are looking for, what they're longing for. Um, and, and, you know, as, as a Christian filmmaker, I also want to be a great and professional storyteller and filmmaker. Just like if I was worked at a fast food shop, I'd be making a great cheeseburger. You know, you yeah. wouldn't know if you ate it, if it was a Christian cheeseburger or not. It just should be a great <laughs> cheeseburger because I'm working unto the Lord. And a lot of times as a filmmaker and when I – I am a Christian filmmaker. I I don't want to be – and I say this with some slowness and caution, but I don't want to be dictated to by my fellow Christians. A lot of times, you know, we can kind of eat our own. And if if I write something or do something in one of my film projects that someone else might not perceive as, uh, uh, you know, unto the Lord – then they're going to judge me based upon what that connection is. And I really don't want that judgment. Yeah. <laughs> so I want the freedom to move within it. I know there's some people that would be willing to, to do a war film, but if you're not going to show the violence of war, in my opinion, then it's probably not the genre you should go into. You're almost doing it a disservice. Now, do we need to glorify it? Absolutely not. I get that there's a wrestling with that needs to occur, but I don't want to be bound by someone else's expectation about my faith. Yeah. And that's, and that's so interesting too, to kind of look at the, the darker side of things that, you know, anybody familiar with the satanic panic of the 1980s, <laughs> as I was, was kind of took, you know, where, where the fantasy world, particularly in the, in the body of Dungeons and Dragons role playing game was yeah. under attack. And so we were like, we were trying to hide our love for fantasy away from these Christians who were coming after us, pitch torque and pitchfork and, and torch. In fact, I, a friend, friends of mine had their mother like found their D and D books and burned them, uh, to put a stop to this kind of evil. And it, so it wasn't much, much later until I realized Hey, these Christians actually are into, <laughs> into fantasy. In fact, Tolkien, yeah. uh, himself having essentially created the whole fantasy genre. Um, but, but a big part of that fantasy genre involves uh, monsters and people listening to the monster professor right now might be going, Hey, why haven't you guys talked about monsters yet? <laughs> so uh -huh. how about we talk about some monsters? Uh, so let me, let me throw a couple of questions at you here. One, like, what is it about, what is it about fantasy and even, I would say, a lot of science fiction that, that 
makes the monster so necessary. Like it's, it's necessary that our heroes encounter the dragon or, or the tribe of orcs or the, or the alien kind of creature, dragon like creature very often. Like what is it about these genres that, that necessitate the monster just as much as say horror would be? And then two, the question that everybody loves but hates to have to answer. <laughs> what is your favorite monster of all time? Yeah. So, you know, it, it definitely is, as we know, in order for the hero, because Almost all heroes have this internal struggle in great stories, and they're not sure they're going to be able to overcome whatever adversity or monster that's before them, and they have to dig deep within themselves to overcome it. And we resonate with that because we know life's like that. Life comes at you hard. It's not easy. And so in order to overcome that, as big as your monster or creature is, is as big and as high as your hero must go. And so we want our heroes to sail. And so our, 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 our creatures and monsters in our stories must be big and they must be believable. They must be good. Um, Hellboy 2, Guillermo del Toro, I thought wrote one of the best bad guys, Prince oh, Nuada. Yeah. Oh yeah. That he was fantastic. I've ever seen on screen. Not only did he look cool, but he had a believable story where I felt some sympathy for him and kind of thought, man, if I was in his shoes, I might do the same thing. And yet I knew he was wrong and the bad guy, right? And I think it was a clear delineation between what makes a really good, believable, um, bad person, a bad character, antagonist. And I think sometimes it's, you can be very overtly, you know, like, like Hitler, right? Yeah. It's just evil. Uh, but even he, Hitler didn't think he was evil, right? Or you can have the Prince Nuada character, um, where there's some, you know, you're not, there's some not clear delineations between it. And yet we know that our hero must even overcome that and have to wrestle with what they're seeing. Yeah. Um, my, my biggest favorite monster i mean you know it's hard not to go back to like your youth and childhood when you see stuff for the first time and yeah. it packs you so you know you're seeing like godzilla from like so i'm 46 i can go back to the 70s where godzilla was walking around you know in the in the in the little suit and it was kind of <laughs> hokey but we all kind of loved it I, actually you can't see me right now but i'm wearing a godzilla shirt from the so, from the suit <laughs> from the like right, the, from the suit 60s. era i mean yeah. you know the godzilla is now great but it that particular one touched us you know it's hard not to go back to clash of the titans uh when you had the cyclops and medusa and you had uh calibus that was created um it's hard not to to flow through you know even like stories like the beastmaster and then (laughs) conan oh my god i haven't haven't thought about beastmaster in so many years right beastmaster you know you had this these great uh you know, these great evil kind of sorceries. You had the, uh, the bird people, you know, that yeah. way, and Beastmaster, that was crazy. Yeah. Um, but if I had to pick, I, I would say that I do love what Peter Jackson did with Lord of the Rings and their depiction of the Balrog. And although short in the films, those of us that are also read the books and love the books, know how deep and rich that character really is. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the Balrog to me, is so much bigger than what potentially the film depicted, but the way the film depicted them, oh man, they brought it. So I'm going to go with the Balrog. <laughs> yeah, we had to dedicate. That's a good pick, man. We, we had to dedicate a whole, a whole class period to. I think we did anyway, essentially to the Balrogs and and their yeah. stories. Because I mean, that was what a what a fantastic way to take the essence of the, the, the Christian sense of the demonic kind of fall in the, in the position of demons and then bring him, yeah. bring him into middle earth. And then, and then Peter Jackson, you know, although went, went away from the books quite a bit and what the Balrog is like stayed true to the art that everybody loves of the Balrog and just made this, made this horrifyingly amazing image and, and sound yeah. <laughs> come to life. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and sound. Yeah. You're right. It all kind of, 
came together. It was quite epic. Well, this I've really enjoyed this conversation, man, and I think I think our listeners are gonna, uh, if not only be entertained, come out uh, more educated about how in the world they can start thinking about a lot of their own projects, about other kind of areas that they can reach out, especially if they're if they're um, tending towards say fantasy and science fiction. But you've got you've got tons of projects we we probably haven't even mentioned. Are there any are there any other kinds of uh, projects that you'd like to you'd like listeners to know about uh, before we close it down? No, I appreciate that. I do have a family friendly film. If you are into Lord of the Rings, you will love it. It is definitely meant for the geeky gamer. It's called The Fellows Hip Rise of the Gamers, and you can find that on the Fantasy Network. Um, I'd be the remiss. The Fellows Hip. I, I get it. I guess. Yes, exactly. There you go. It's, it's, it's also their guild name. So after you watch the film, it even solidifies the naming even more. But, uh, that's just a fun family friendly uh gamer film that we did it was my very first feature film legitimate one and so that's up on the fantasy network uh i you definitely know about the comics i'll be pushing that out but we've got some big plans for the fantasy network and really that's where I'm, i've kind of put all my eggs in that basket right now i'm actually going out to la for an extended stay to try to get some other projects extended but what i would say is uh, to all the li- listeners out there, remember two things is that, you know, in the 50s, we kind of shunned Hollywood and, and chose to disconnect. And that's what we must not do. We must engage because story is powerful and we know that. And two, that you are not alone and you don't need to do this alone. There are people out there willing to help and I'm certainly one of them. So uh, I mentioned my email, but just to give it again, Ron at the fantasy dot network i'm happy to help where and how i can well that's a what more beautiful ending than that right there man so thank you so much it's been a real pleasure to talking with you that was a lot of fun talking to you too i appreciate the time 